All right, in this video, we're going to be going over how to calculate a within subjects t test by hand. I've already taken the liberty of writing up some sample data from a hypothetical experiment. This is an experiment that has a repeated measures design with eight participants, such that all eight participants serve in both condition one and in condition two. Now, Condition one is actually a placebo condition in this hypothetical experiment. And condition two is when the participants are administered a so-called cognitive enhancer that supposedly increases IQ score. Now, with that, guys, the actual data that we have are scores from a hypothetical IQ test. So all the IQ scores when people got the placebo and all the IQ scores from when they got the cognitive enhancer. Now, whenever you conduct a hypothesis test like this, it helps to follow a process. The process I use is based on a textbook called Statistics for the Behavioral Sciences by Frederick Gravatier and Larry Walnu. Um, so with that in mind, let's get started on this t-test. So the first thing that you're going to need to do is actually go ahead and state your statistical hypotheses. Now note that these are not the scientific hypotheses based upon you know, what you think the cognitive enhancer is going to do, they are the statistical hypotheses. Specifically, your null hypothesis, which for a within subjects t-test essentially states that, hey, everything that you're seeing is due to random chance and that the population mean of the population of different scores is equal to zero and it's mutually exclusive and exhaustive alternative hypothesis that the mean of the population of different scores is not equal to zero. After you have those hypotheses laid out, you need to set the criteria for which you would actually reject this null hypothesis. All right, so to set your rejection criteria, there are several things that you need to know from the get-go. First is whether you're conducting a two-tailed test or a one-tailed test. If we look at our null and alternative hypotheses, this will cue us in as to whether we're using a one or two-tailed test or whatever example you're working on will tell you. So in this case, because something could be not equal to zero, either being above it or below it, we have a two-tailed test. Now, the other thing that you need to know is your alpha level or your decision rule. Now, in most behavioral and biological sciences, the standard is typically 0.05. So what that essentially means is that any test statistic we observe that has a probability of occurring less than 0.05 if we get such a statistic, that's when we reject the null hypothesis. So our test statistic, that t statistic that we'll be getting at, comes from or will be compared against a hypothetical t distribution. Now, in this t distribution, the most extreme 5% of scores in either tail correspond to those low probability test statistics. So the tails in both directions are called the critical regions. All right, now those critical regions are bound by critical values. And it's these critical values that we will now need to look up in a table in order to know if whatever test disk we get at is greater than the upper critical value, placing it in this critical region, or less than this critical value, placing it in the lower critical region. So to do that, there's still one more piece of information we need. This T distribution varies based on the degrees of freedom. Now, 
for a t-test, specifically a dependent samples t-test, our degrees of freedom are going to be equal to n minus 1. n is still our number of participants, which we see is 8. So we have 8 minus 1 to get us 7. To get us 7. There we go. Pay no attention to that. All right, so from this point, you would probably go to whatever statistical textbook you're looking at or using and then looking up your critical value. So you would go over, usually in the left-hand column is the degrees of freedom, in our case, 7. And then we would go over and figure out with our alpha level, and we'd see that we have a T critical value corresponding to that critical value of 2.365 meaning that we have 2.365 for this critical value and we have negative 2.365 for this critical value. So if we get a T observed or a test statistic that falls into either of these critical regions which would be greater than 2.365 or less than negative 2.365 then we would reject this null hypothesis. So our next step is to actually go about calculating our test statistic. Now, when we go about doing this, it's helpful, or at least I find it very helpful, if you follow sort of this set process where you try and keep things as simple as possible and set up sub goals and tackle each part of it one thing at a time. So to start with that, you have your t-value that you need to look up. And we'd look up the formula for this and see that it's the mean of the different scores minus the mean of the population of different scores, specifically based on your null hypothesis, divided by the standard error of the different scores, so SMD. Now, at this point, we don't have any of this, nor do we even have the values to get at it. So Next thing we would do is we would slowly write out the formulas for each one. So D bar, the mean of the different scores would be sigma D divided by N. Don't have those yet. However, we also will need this value right here, the standard of the different scores. So S M D is going to be equal to the standard deviation of the different scores divided by the square root of N. Now, to make this work, we really do need that standard deviation of the different scores. And when we look at how we get that, it is just the variance of the different scores. To get the variance of the different scores, we need the sum of squares of the different scores divided by n minus 1, or your degrees of freedom. So the last thing that we need is that sum of squares of the different scores. And we can see that, that would actually be equal to, oh, right in the next, the sum of the square different scores minus the sum of the different scores squared divided by n. So it's really just the same formula for sum of squares at this point. So now what we'll do is we'll try and work our way back up. But the one thing we don't have yet is different scores. To get that, we actually have to subtract the score in condition 1 from condition 2 or vice versa. It really doesn't matter the direction in this case. So the easiest way I found to do this is just to give yourself a couple extra columns in your table. We know that we're going to need all of the different scores and we know we're going to need to add them up and we know we're going to need the sum of all the squared different scores. So let's find all those different scores and then let's square them and then add another row at the bottom to add everything up. So if we go 100 minus 103, we're talking negative 2. 100 minus 101, negative 1. 99 minus 99 is 0. Negative 3, 2, 3, 2, 0. Negative 2 squared is 4. Negative 1 squared is 1, 0, 9, 4, 9, 4, 0. 
so we can find those differences and we can square them real quick and then we can go about adding them all together. All right, so in this case, just to make my life simple, we're going to have 0 minus 2 minus 1 plus 0 minus 3 plus 2 plus 3 plus 2 plus 0 to get us 1. And then 4 plus 1 plus 0 plus 9 plus 4 plus 9 plus 4 plus 0 to get us 31. Now, when you add these up, it's really easy to make a single keystroke error, so it pays to check your math. Um, this isn't the first time I've calculated out this problem, so I actually know that these are right. But this is when you would want to step and add that up a second time to make sure you got it right. So now that we have these two numbers, we can jump back down in here at essentially the bottom of our list of formulas. So sigma d squared is 31 minus sigma d 1 squared divided by n, which is 8. So 31 minus 1 squared is 1, so minus 1 8. Room below? No, I don't. And so we would essentially come to 31. I'm going to cheat and make this all decimal. 1 divided by 8 gets us 0 0.125. So 31 minus 0.125 gets us 30.875. All right, so now we can come up here. 30.875 divided by 8 minus 1, 30.875 divided by 7, by 7 gets us 4.41. Now I'm going to round to two decimal places as I write out here, but I'm actually going to keep as much as I can in my calculator as I go. All right. So now we essentially now need the square root of that. And my calculator is a bit of a pain in the butt when it comes to that. So I have to do square root of 4.41. So just carrying out the two decimal places gets us 2.1. Then we have 2.1 divided by the square root of our n, which is 8. So. We need the square root of 8, which is going to get us 2.1 divided by 2.83. 2.1 divided by 2.83 gets us 0 0.74. Now, here, we can actually get this part right here to get our mean. Some of the different scores is 1 divided by 8 gets us. 0 0.125 and then we can come right back up here so 0 0.125 minus 0 divided by 0 0.74 0 0.125 divided by 0 0.74 0 0.125 divided by 0 0.74 gets us 0 0.168, so 0 0.17, 0 0.17. All right, so from here, what we then need to do is actually interpret our test statistic. So if we think about our t distribution, and we just sketch it out here real quick, we have our critical region over here, critical region over here, 2.365, 2.365, and 
and then we have zero because it's symmetrical about zero. When we think about our test value of 0 0.17, we are probably somewhere right here. So we're most definitely not in the critical region. Therefore, we do not have an extreme value that has a less than a 5% chance of occurring due to random chance. So we fail to reject. Now, one thing you should always do after this point is write up and report your results because it doesn't matter if you figured all this out, but you can't tell anyone. And if you tell most people that you failed to reject the null hypothesis in your experiment, they're not going to know what you mean. So we need to put this in terms that are a little bit more concise and easier to understand. So let's go ahead and report our results. Now I'm going to report them in APA style, which has sort of this specific way you have to tell everything. So in this case, it needs to be in the form of sentence, the cognitive uh, enhancer did not produce a statistically significant mean difference. Now note, when you write this out, the term statistically significant is essentially code for rejecting the null hypothesis. So we are negating rejecting the null hypothesis. We're failing to reject. It means the same thing. Then what you have to do, especially if you were writing this up in a publication, is you need to report all the different pieces. So we conducted a t-test, and we're looking at a t-statistic, so indicate that with the letter t. Then in parentheses, you need to provide your degrees of freedom. And then what your actual t value was, so in this case it is 0 0.17. Then you need to have a p-value statement. So what you're saying is what is the probability of getting this test statistic? So p for probability. Now the probability of getting this test statistic is greater than 5% based on it being in this middle area and not falling inside either of our critical regions. So the probability is greater than 0.05. Now if you had a statistical software program and you got an exact p-value, you can report that as well with p equals whatever, but when you're calculating it out by hand, you can't really get an exact p-value. So it's greater than or less than your alpha level, which in this case is 0.05. Um, good luck, and have at it.